thank you very much and thank you so much for inviting me. This is actually the third time I've spoken to this convention. I've done Cape Town and I was here in Johannesburg, I think, four years ago. And I have to say that the conversations afterwards, actually at all the conferences where there are actors, is always, always really, really stimulating. So thank you for inviting me and, and I really look forward to some interesting uh, conversations. Um, I was in the room when you had that amazing talk a few minutes ago on South Africa and how wonderful South Africa was and trying to sort out all the problems. Um, I'm not gonna talk about South Africa at all. In fact, I've only got two statistics on South Africa, because that's your world, you know that. Uh, and I have been asked to talk much more globally uh, and really to tackle this. Uh, look at the science, both the demographic and the biological science, behind our understanding of longevity, life expectancy, and increasingly important, healthy life expectancy. So I'm going to take you through some of the ideas that we're working on, uh, and hopefully it will be a sort of broad background uh, to the maybe more focused work uh, you do in your daily lives. So, this person probably is known to many of you. He is the world's first super centenarian. That's someone who reached 110 years old. And we don't know much about him. Uh, we know that he was born in what was then called the Low Countries, and we now call that the Netherlands. Uh, and we know that he was a foot soldier with Napoleon, because amazingly, he was born in 1788, and he lived 110 years and nearly made it uh, into the 20th century. He nearly was the first verified human to live in three centuries. He just missed that. Uh, and the really important point is there have always been long-lived people. To live long is not unusual, but of course we're now seeing the mass aging of populations. Uh, these are uh, two, the two longest lived men and, uh, or man and woman. Uh, the longest lived is Jean Colmont of France, who made it to 122. Uh, and then we have um, Kimura of Japan, who made it to 116. And it actually is a very important indicator at the individual level of what's happening at the national level. Because of course, the two longest lived countries are Japan and France. Uh, and women consistently live longer than men. What I think has changed, even since I was last here, but has definitely changed over the last five, maybe 10 years, but definitely uh, five years, uh, is the multidisciplinary approach we're now taking to understanding longevity and particularly the biologists working with the social scientists. So the economists and the demographers, the biologists, the medical people and the social scientists beginning to work together to try and tease out and understand why are we having increasing life expectancy, the average age of the population generally, and increasing longevity, which is pushing back our maximum ages. Um, and we know, for example, that there's a real interaction between the cellular process, that that is affected by our behavior and our environment. Uh, and we also know that society is framing these processes. Uh, so, for example, in a minute, we're going to look at life expectancy in different parts of the world. And when you see those, you will see that the life expectancy here in South Africa is about 20 years lower at birth than in the higher income countries of Europe uh, and Asia. And a lot of that, of course, is to do with the society uh, that frames that demography. I think this is a wonderful um, example of how we understand, we, we do a lot of work at the moment with biologists trying to understand this interaction between society and biology. Uh, we know, for example, there are stresses in our world, retirement, bereavement, disease, and they manifest themselves during life course events, but we also increasingly know how we can make ourselves more resilient. Exercise, social networks, economic security, they all protect against cellular damage. That's the kind of interactions that we are now at. I think this is another really important point, um, and those of you who know my work know I have repeated this consistently, to grow old in a society which is itself aging is very, very different to grow old in a society which is young. And I think there's a really interesting contrast between European societies where we are growing old in a very old society and this part of the world where many South Africans are growing old in a predominantly young 
society. Uh, and therefore, things like the resources that are given to older adults to maintain uh, their um, well-being uh, are limited because there are so many other resources needed for the younger people uh, within uh, your society. Even terms like resources for research. We have huge amount of research in Europe and the US now in aging related. The government in the UK has just announced 98 million to look at healthy aging. That's because we're an old society. Within Europe soon, we will have half our population aged over 50. We've never had a region of the world where half the population is aged between 50 and 100. Very, very different dynamic in distribution of resources there uh, from, obviously, uh, countries on the African continent. So, let's look at some of these questions. Number one is, will increases in life expectancy continue? I am sure many of you, this is something that you're very concerned with at the moment. We're going to talk about that uh, in a minute. How long will our children and grandchildren live? Really importantly, will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? Or are we pushing back life expectancies in many high-income countries, but healthy life expectancy is not keeping up? So, let's look at this uh, first one, and in a minute you'll see why this baby is looking quite so shocked uh, at their potential life expectancy. So, will increases in both life expectancy and life extension or longevity continue? And I think it's really important, uh, demographers use the term longevity slightly differently from uh, your world, I think. So when we talk about longevity, we mean maximum life uh, spans. Whereas I think you talk about you know, issues around longevity and really you're talking about life expectancy, the mass uh, aging of the population. So here we have um, some selected OECD countries. Uh, this is life expectancy at birth. Um, and you can see that the bold lines are women and the uh, spotty lines are men. Consistently, in all countries, women live longer than men. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. And you can see right at the top, the two longest lived nations. The red are Japan and the dark blue are France. This is women at birth, but you can see how Spain has also crept up. If I say that roughly we're talking about life expectancies at birth in Japan, France, and Spain for women of about 87, and you realize that life expectancies here in South Africa are 61.7 for men and 67.7 for women, clearly, at the national level, there is a huge diversity. But if we were to take a European-style population living in this country, we would mirror much more the European style. So inequality within a population and its impact on national life expectancies, just remember that thought because it's going to keep occurring. And then at the bottom, we drop the orange is UK and the red is US, and then we go down to the dotted line uh, where the men are. Now, as an English woman, I can sort of understand why Japanese women from birth live so much longer than I do, but I cannot understand why French women live so much longer than me. <laughs> we only have a channel between us. Um, I had a really nice sabbatical last year in Paris, talking to lots of French demographers, uh, and they made a really interesting point that actually we shouldn't be looking at the national statistic. The line isn't the channel, or Le Manche, if you're French, the line runs across the center of France, in so much as northern French women have the same life expectancy as English women. And it is the Mediterranean women, along with the Spanish women, who also are similarly have a Mediterranean-type lifestyle, that they believe that are encouraging the long lives. And indeed, increasingly, we know that the Mediterranean lifestyle, in particular, seems to have the elements at the population level of allowing people to live longer and longer. A little bit of alcohol, fresh fruit and vegetables, reducing meat and eating more fish, not smoking, although both French and Spanish women uh, do smoke, vitamin D, matters of it here at the moment, vitamin D, very, very important, outside lifestyle, social networking. They're all the kind of things that people increasingly believe actually are the reason why these Mediterranean uh, women in particular uh, are living so long. <laughs> but obviously, in many, many ways, not so much here, 
<coughs> in Africa, but definitely in Europe and the US, we really shouldn't be looking at life expectancy at birth because over half our population not only makes it to 60, but actually makes it uh, well beyond 60. So increasingly, this is the statistic we're interested in, life expectancy at 60. And again, you can see exactly the same kind of pattern. Japan and France have eased a little bit away from Spain, but basically uh, it's the same. And then this gap down to the UK and the US. There are obviously other countries in between, um, but that's just uh, to give you that example. And similarly, if we look at 80, similar kind of patterning. The men are beginning to catch up in these high-income countries, uh, but you can see that the same three countries are dominating at the top. <clears throat> the speed at which this has happened is quite extraordinary. Um, if we look back at when um, Bismarck introduced the pension into European countries in the middle of the 19th century, half the European population was dead by 45. Now half the European population is going to make it to well over 80. Half the European population makes it to well over 80. And remember, Bismarck set the age at which people received the pension to be 65. Half the population was dead by 45. So those mathematicians in the audience already know that actually, given that half the European population is going to make it probably nearly to 85, the real state pension in Europe should be 103. <clears throat> in a way, I don't have to point this out to this audience, but to many other audiences I do. And again, this is another point to focus on. Look at the variation year on year with life expectancy, and I'm sure you're aware of what I'm going to come back to uh, in a minute. So, the other really interesting thing is that women consistently live longer than men, and I'm sure you're aware that there are some people out there who feel that as women take on male lifestyles, so our life expectancies will come further together. Definitely there is some evidence. Um, in the UK, for example, um, we know that life expectancy for men at 70 is still increasing. For women, it's beginning to flatten a little bit. But generally, at every stage of the life, males uh, have a higher mortality than females. So in the womb, when they're children, when they're adolescents, etc. And if I talk to my biology friends or colleagues at Oxford about this, <coughs> I'm really sorry, your air is very dry. <coughs> and I, uh, I come from a really damp part of the world. <coughs> um, so for example, um, if we look at the actual gen um, physical and anatomy and the makeup between men and women, there are clearly some very obvious um, uh, differences. If we look at the genetic makeup, for example, I'm sure you're all aware that um, men are XY and women are XX. And as I keep telling my son, most of the genetic material is carried on the X chromosome and is inherited from the mother. But it also means that we women in the audience, we have a backup. Because so much genetic material is on that X chromosome, if anything goes wrong, we actually have a backup gene to come in, and men don't have that. If we look um, at birds, slightly different letters, but let's keep them XY. Male birds are XX, and female birds are XY, and male birds tend to live longer than female birds. So there is a, a thought within genetics that this may be one of the factors. There's also a lot of research around the immune system, uh, and we know, we used to think that women were better at fighting off um, uh, viruses and men were fighting off bacteria, but we now know that actually women are far better at fighting off both viruses and bacteria as a population. And that's sort of mixed news for women in the audience because it means that we're obviously fitter and healthier than the men, but it also means that man flu probably is right. So. <laughs> When he's whinging away, maybe he does feel a little worse than we would. <laughs> but the really, I think, um, striking uh, area of research um, is around the hormonal system. And again, obviously, women have predominantly, for a lot of their adult lives, estrogen, men, testosterone. And again, we used to think that um, we knew that estrogen protected, and we used to think that testosterone didn't protect, but that was about it. We now think that actually it increases both morbidity and mortality. 
And there's a fantastic um, piece of historical research out of Korea where they looked at um, Korean uh, court records. Uh, and of course, they had a large number uh, of eunuchs, castrated men, in the courts. And when they looked at these records, the castrated men live on average 20 years longer than the uncastrated men. So there's alcohol, there's smoking, there's... <clears throat> Depends how far you want to go with this, really. <clears throat> okay. So generally, how long do demographers think we're going to be living? And again, let's just look at life expectancy and we'll look at longevity a little later. So I'm just going to give you two studies which have looked at pro, um, projecting life expectancy forward. This one came out in The Lancet in 2017 and caused a real stir. Um, this is WHO data. It is um, probabilistic modeling. And if we zoom in, we can see, not surprisingly, in fact, there we have France, Japan, and Spain, but South Korea by 2030 has topped uh, the list. And the really important thing is that this study uh, projects that by 2030, Korean women will have a life expectancy from birth of 90. And there was some kind of mythology in demography that you would never get life expectancies at birth over 90. But it looks within 10 years, at least one country potentially uh, could be there. Another study which again caused a bit of a stir, again published in The Lancet, um, and what they did here was look at the oldest age at which at least 50% of the birth cohort would still be alive. Now, this was published in 2009, and so at the end here, we have the 2007 birth cohort. Uh, right at the top, in the brown, we have Japan. They project that half the babies born in Japan in 2007 will make it to 107. Uh, the UK and um, France... Uh, no, it's a US and France are going to make it to 104 and the um, UK to 103. Two completely different data sets, completely different modeling, but this is what uh, they're suggesting. Um, there's been a huge increase in the amount of work that is now published around centenarians. Um, and this is just uh, some UK modeling that was done by one of my colleagues, George Leeson, out of Oxford. Um, and uh, what he did was we currently have about 14,000 centenarians in the UK. Uh, and he presented uh, this paper, because if you look at the green line, his modeling suggests that by the middle of the century, we will have half a million centenarians in the UK, and we will have 1.4 million by the end of the century. And actually, when he presented this paper, we went, we think you've got your modeling wrong. And then ONS came out with a whole load of modeling from the data itself, he had used this data, they then projected models, and they came up with exactly the same picture. Uh, we think about 8 million people in the UK will make it to a century. We think 120 million Europeans will make it to a century. Uh, and similarly, we've done similar work in the US. 6 million people aged over 100 uh, by about 2080 in the US. Now, all of you will be aware uh, that you have to look at it statistically, and of course, it isn't just that we're going to be living longer, it's also we've got these huge birth cohorts in both Europe and the US who were born in basically after the Second World War. So all those people who were born in the, 20, in the 1950s and 1960s, if they live to a century, then by the middle of the century, there's going to be a massive group of them uh, coming up. And that's why we're going to get so many numbers uh, of those um, ages. Um, so another really interesting question is, Will increases in life expectancy be accompanied by increases in the extension of life, or are we going to see a compression of longevity after 100? Um, some people argue, yes, all these people are going to get to 100, but then actually it's really going to uh, cut off. And here I'm drawing on a colleague of mine, uh, Rabin, again, out of Paris. And what he did, um, he's done this study now both on Japan and on France because we have sufficiently large numbers at older ages to be able to do this more sophisticated modeling. <coughs> and he looked at the change in distribution at ages of death for women in Japan comparing uh, 1950 to uh, 2004. Um, this dark line uh, is the um, curve, uh, death curve, uh, 2000 to 2004, and if you look at that red line, 
that was 1980, you can see already how we're shifting. And all the evidence is that yes, we are, that bell curve is shifting uh, across more people 100, more people 110, more people 115, uh, etc. However, there's also, again, because we're getting numbers who are living to these you know, super centenarian ages, it may well be in our genes. It may well be that we have some people, and we know obviously that longevity tends to run in families, uh, who are just genetically predisposed to live longer. And of course, because we have conquered infectious diseases, accidents, all those other kind of things that tended to kill people at younger uh, lives, not only do we have more chronic disease as we get older, but the successful ages, eight people aging, were not uh, cut off in their prime by an infectious disease or by a war or whatever. So this is um, some work that was published um, about 15 years ago when we began to think about this. Do some of us simply age less fast than others? Uh, and this is a study where they looked at longevity case participants and controls, and they suggested that the longevity case participants were healthier than the controls, despite the fact that they were about 10.8 years older, and concluded, we think we should introduce the concept of the healthy aging phenotype, whereby certain individuals are able to delay or avoid major clinical diseases and disabilities until very late age. And we now know that that's true. If you have a group of people who've made it to 110, many of them are very fit and healthy throughout that first decade of the century, and then they become ill and die very quickly. So, more research has now been done. Uh, this was published um, in um, the Biological Science uh, of Medicine Society. Uh, supercentenarians display, displayed an exceptionally healthy aging phenotype, whereby clinically apparent major chronic disease and disabilities were markedly delayed, often way beyond 100. Little clinical history of cardiovascular disease, no history of cancer or diabetes. Similarly, this is a much more modern study, 2015. Our long-lived cases had a metabolic profile that suggested higher insulin sensitivity at younger ages, uh, and lower waist-hip ratio, lower glucose, lower insulin, lower diabetes, etc. And this all came to a, a head in nature um, in 2016, um, because we had uh, a, a group at the top led by Dong, uh, and they um, came up with the hypothesis uh, uh, through some modeling that they had done, is our results strongly suggest that the maximum lifespan of humans is fixed at 115 and subject to natural constraints. Now, A, we have a lot of people who've now lived well over 115, but still, they suggested that there was a natural limit on how long humans could live. And this debate has been raging for some time, and to a certain extent, people thought we'd moved on, but they decided to uh, re-establish it again. And the repost they got, I mean, if you look at that debate, um, they were completely isolated by the longevity community. Very, very few people supported them. And I think the main repost came up with the conclusion, our current understanding of the biology of aging points firmly away from any idea that the end of life is genetically programmed. So, you may have heard of Aubrey de Grey. I often get put on panels with Aubrey de Grey. If you don't know him, he's the man who thinks we probably can live to 1,000 and that the first person able to live to 1,000 has been born. Um, I think that kind of thinking obviously stretches our minds beyond the limits of probably what is possible. Um, but I think, although I would never agree with Aubrey de Grey, I think the general view is that yes, are we going to be able to live to 120, 150, 200 as a population? Probably that is possible given science and technology, and we will conclude by looking at that area. There probably isn't a fixed age at which we can't possibly live any longer, uh, but we have to understand that it's probably somewhere between the two. It's a contested argument, and anybody who says it's fixed or says we can live to 200, 300, 400 within the lifetime of this audience probably uh, is overclaiming. But definitely, we have these healthy phenotypes out there. So, the next big question is actually the inequality question. So, will life expectancy increase in, life with life ex increase in line with life extension? So, will we all enjoy the benefits of longevity, or will it just be for a few of us? 
And as I say, here in this part of the world, I'm sure you can really understand that kind of argument. I mean, we're talking about life expectancies of women at birth in Japan, 88 now. Sierra Leone, a young boy, has a life expectancy of 35. So huge inequalities, but also within countries, not just in African countries, but in European countries, there is massive inequality in life expectancies. <coughs> and the reason why this is important is this, and I'm sure this is really familiar, well, I hope it's really familiar, uh, to everybody in the room, and that is the phenomenon that not only within the EU 28, and it is 28, not 27, 28, um, and also in the US, life expectancy from 2015 started to flatten and in some cases possibly decline. And there was this huge discussion, 2015, 2016, it seemed to continue. Now, one of the things obviously is a statistical issue. Remember I said watch how it just goes up and down year on year when you get to the very late ages. And we know that when we have large numbers of people in their 80s and 90s, they're very vulnerable, you only need a flu epidemic. And in fact, 2015, we know there was a flu epidemic that killed far more older adults than it should have. Um, so it could be statistical. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> it could be something that is happening to the human population or it could be around inequalities. And two, I think, very influential uh, papers came out, one in the BMJ on England uh, and one in epidemiology on the US, and they both argued really, really strongly that it was inequality in the population that was reducing national life expectancies. And indeed, we now know in the UK at Oxford, we've done modeling using the latest ONS data, and it's very, very clear that if you look at our top, top socioeconomic groups, they are still continuing to increase their life expectancy, but our bottom socioeconomic groups, the men are flat and older women are actually falling. So it seems that inequality in our society is reducing life expectancy increase at the national level. Now, it may be more complicated than that, but that definitely, I would suggest, is one of the drivers. Inequality in mortality. And I want to draw here just to demonstrate how pernicious it really is on a study that we did in the UK um, where we had access to two and a half million occupational pension records. So immediately we're going to start looking at a subpopulation because we're not looking at Africa, we're looking at a European country and we're not looking at the whole of that country. It's not the Whitehall study. This is occupational pensions. These are people already who are plucked out. They have secure employment with occupational work-related pensions. We've already got rid of those people in the gig economy, those people, zero arcs, contacts, those people who don't even have employment and are, are, are rush, um, sweeping the streets. This is a very, very specific group. But look at the inequality and mortality that we found. I'm just showing you here comparison of UK life expectancies from age 65 for men. Um, on the first side, we have our low, our bottom 25% in terms of life expectancy, tended to be low income, ill health retiree, unhealthy lifestyle. At 65, they had 12 more years. And at the top, we have our top 20%, high income, normal health retiree, healthy lifestyle. They had 22 years. That's a 10 year difference in Britain between a subset. So inequality is rife in life expectancy. So much so that if you run this forward, this is the proportion of 65-year-old men who will, are expected to survive to each older age by year. We have our healthy at the top, we have our unhealthy at the bottom, and you can see that by the time they reach 85, there's a 50% increased probability of the lower group dying per year than the top group. Now, we could really tease this out because it was a very powerful, big uh, data set. So, <coughs> at the top, <coughs> remaining life expectancy from 65. Manual employee, poor, unhealthy lifestyle, ill health retiree, had his 12 years. If he'd done a non-manual job, 0 0.4 years. If he'd had a high income, 2.6. But look at the two bottom ones. If he'd retired in normal health, he would have added an extra three years on. And really importantly, if he'd had a healthy lifestyle, four. 
So the really strong message that is coming out, not only from demographers, but also from our medical and biological friends, is it's health across the life course. We have to have health across the life course within a population to continue life expectancy, and as we'll see in a minute, healthy life expectancy. This, I think, is absolutely shocking. So this is from England and Wales. Um, I chaired a big government review, and this is some of the modeling we did for the UK government. And the way you have to interpret this is that the dark green is life expectancy, and that sort of limey, yellowy is healthy life expectancy. On this side, these are the most deprived areas in, the, in England and Wales, and then that far side are the most affluent or the least deprived. And if you look, if you are a man aged 65 living in one of our least deprived, our most deprived, our poorest areas in England and Wales, at age 65, you will probably make it to 80, but all of your 70s will be in ill health. And if you live in one of our more affluent areas, the least deprived, at 65, you will probably make it to your late 80s or even 90. And you will not go into ill health until you hit 80. So the whole of one's 70s vary tremendously between whether you're in the bottom or whether you're in the top of society within England and Wales. Huge difference. So, let's really tease this out. Will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? Will we all be able to do this by the time we get to 50 or 60 or 80? <clears throat> so, similar kind of, again, these are um, WHO figures. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that there's huge problems with trying to work out healthy life expectancy. We're using the European healthy life years and using WHO data. And what we've done here is we're just going to look for women. And again, we've got um, at the top, Japan, life expectancy, France, Spain, and then we drop UK and the US. Slightly different at age 60 because this is WHO rather than UN data, but still. And then at the bottom, that is healthy life expectancy. And you can immediately see the problem. So this is a 60-year-old woman, and you can see that when she is 60, if she is red, in other words, she lives in Japan, she has um, approximately 29 years of life left, but only 23 of them will be healthy. And in every country, it is the same. And the only reason I show you this is because we need some sort of positive stuff coming out of the UK. And here, you can, I'm just aware that Boris is you know, doing things at the moment um, as we speak. Um, you can see this is UK life expectancy um, is the orange and UK healthy life expectancy. This is for 80-year-old women and we actually do best. We have closed the gap better, in fact, than France, than Spain have. So it is that gap, that gap between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Are we closing it or are we increasing it? And there is a lot of research that is suggesting that the pharma and the science that is giving us longer life expectancy is actually keeping us alive uh, in ill health for longer. So let's look at this one. People always want to know about this. Obesity, what is obesity doing to life expectancy and healthy life expectancy? And remember, it's very, very clear, we've got to talk about health across the life course. What you do in your 30s and 40s impacts on your health in your 80s and 90s, and even way down to childhood. So the big debate is, will obesity reduce life expectancy or just healthy life expectancy? Some people have argued that our children coming through they will have lower life expectancies than their parents did because of ill healthy, unhealthy lifestyles and obesity. Now, this is a quote. I was at the University of Chicago for a while, and this is a quote from one of my colleagues, Jay Oshansky. He's a biogerontologist or a biodemographer, fantastic researcher, but loves making these big statements. And in the New England Journal of Medicine, he wrote in 2005, <coughs> Let's look at the bottom one. 
We anticipate that as a result of the substantial rise in the prevalence of obesity and its life-shortening complications, there wasn't actually evidence that that was life-shortening, but still life-shortening complications such as diabetes, life expectancy at birth and at older ages could level off or even decline within the first half of this century. And of course, because we know that life expectancy is flattening, maybe he is right. I think the evidence isn't there, but maybe he is right. So let's look at some uh, results. Um, this, it, most of this actually comes from the Lancet and its European data. So higher BMI is associated with risk factors for vascular disease, we know that. We know a higher BMI or a more obesity is associated with an increased risk of diabetes. And there is also some evidence that higher BMI is associated with reduced life expectancy. So this came out in The Lancet in 2009. And I think what we're now beginning to realize is that, of course, there isn't just obesity and non-obesity, it is a complete spectrum. And most of the evidence that is now coming up, there was a big American study a couple of years ago, <coughs> suggests that at low levels of obesity, actually, life expectancy isn't affected that much, but healthy life expectancy is. At the high levels of obesity, yes, we are reducing life expectancy. But this statement probably pertains to the very obese and rather than just not obesity in general. And this is my, I love this study. Um, this is a Dutch study done in 2011. It was replicated very similarly in this big American study I mentioned. Um, and what they did was they looked, it was a large um, sample, a large uh, population that they looked at of Dutch. Um, and they were interested in different drivers and how they affected disability in later life. This particular table, age 55, they looked at obesity, smoking, and alcohol. How much did it reduce life expectancy, and how much did it increase disabled years? And what they found really convincingly, and it's, I think it's a really robust study, is that smoking and alcohol, which we know are killers, if they're abused, well, all smoking is, and if you abuse alcohol, it's a killer, um, it reduces life expectancy by three to four years. Uh, it also increases disabled years by about three to four years. But look at the obesity line. It only reduces life expectancy by 1.4 year, years, but it increases disabled years by nearly six. And as I say, this increasingly, this kind of evidence seems to be the evidence that we're finding from studies that actually obesity, unhealthy lifestyles across the life course probably will not dramatically reduce life expectancy at the population level, but it will increase disabled years, or in other words, it will reduce healthy life expectancy, and that is not good news. So, even with advances in healthy life expectancy, will increases in the numbers of older adults increase the morbidity within our population? In other words, even if we start reducing the incidence and the prevalence of chronic diseases, will there be so many older adults, particularly in our high-income countries, that we are going to increase general morbidity within our population? This is the good news. This is the dementia picture. And I'm going to give you two studies, and actually I think it is good news. There, from a pharma point of view, as you know, the news on dementia has not been particularly good, despite decades now, but definitely at least two decades of serious research. We are not making that much impact from a pharma point of view in the drug treatment uh, of particularly Alzheimer's, but also other forms of dementia. But this, at the population level, is a really good story. So this comes out of Cambridge, um, and it is the Cognitive Function and Aging Study. And it's a longitudinal study, uh, 1991, and then 2011. And what they did was, they took CFAS1 is the earlier one, and CFAS2 is the later one. And they said, basically, uh, what will be both the age what will be the prevalence and the incidence of dementia within the population? And they discovered that there was quite a significant drop between those two test periods. And they thought, well, is it pharma? Because we know actually that some of the uh, drugs that we're taking, particularly the cardiovascular drugs, uh, are actually in 
increasing uh, mental well-being from a um, capacity point of view? Um, is it just increased lifestyles that maybe people are eating better, better nutrition? And the one thing that they then decided that they would look at was education. Because we know that there's a relationship between education and the expression of the symptoms of dementia. So the more highly educated you are, the more uh, you are able, if you like, either to suppress or not to show dementia symptoms. And we're not quite sure whether the more education you have, the more you keep yourself mentally active and therefore you fight off, you ward off dementia, or whether in fact the more highly educated you are, you're able to hide the symptoms of dementia. But we know that there is an association. So they thought the UK population is better educated, maybe that is reducing both age-specific incidence and age-specific prevalence. And then this fantastic study came out in JAMA, um, this is the um, American Journal of Medicine, using something called the Health and Retirement Survey, which has been going now since the early 90s. And they found exactly the same. So dementia prevalence declined significantly from 11.6 in 2000 to 8.8 .8 in 2012. And they were able to show that it was the influence of one year's extra schooling. In other words, the group that were coming into old age, they didn't leave school at 14, they left school at 15. And that one year seemed to have carried that influence across their lives. Now, we know that education, hopefully, but in practice, is increasing generally uh, across the world and across all populations. So the more highly educated populations we have, the lower the incidence and prevalence of dementia we hope we will get. But having said that, it's not all positive. So this is an English uh, study. Very, very quickly, um, if you look, this is the estimated numbers of people with dementia by age. 2010 projected to 2040, and if you look at the dark, dark blue, just below the stripes, that's 70. So everything below that is people who are younger than 70. And the really good picture is you can see that going forward, very, very few people under 70 are going to get dementia. But because we have so many people living well over 90 to 100 and even beyond 100, the actual numbers of people within our population with dementia are likely to increase. So, mixed message, but at least we're going the right way. Similarly, the same kind of picture is coming out in most European countries. Um, if you look on this side, uh, this is the prevalence, um, in particular, uh, of um, a certain measure of disability. You can see it's flat between 2015 and 2025 in a projection. But if you look at the cases, they're going to go up. We've got more older adults in our population. Um, and this is the inequality story. So in other words, um, in, again, this is a, a UK study, crude incidence of heart failure would be reduced by 18% if the whole population had the incidence of the least deprived qu um, quintile. So in other words, the top one is our most deprived socioeconomic group, and our bottom one is the least deprived. So if we could solve inequality in the UK, we would dramatically reduce uh, chronic morbidities uh, in our whole population, but particularly in our older population. So to conclude, where are we going to go? Um, this is where we are at the moment. In other words, everything I've showed you really uh, has been shaped by two things, an increase in healthy living, and disease prevention and cure. Um, in other words, at the moment, we've been looking at how can we, um, how much life expectancy can we expect to gain without scientific medicine? Just looking at the kind of lifestyle change. Um, it's this kind of thing. <coughs> so, I'm a vegetarian. I find the amount of vegetables you have to eat in order actually to reduce developing these illnesses quite horrendous. So if you're a meat-eating audience, you also might be quite surprised. So this was published in the International Journal of Epidemiology. This is percentage reduced risk in developing illness between two and a half portions, which are the dark grey, and ten portions of vegetables a day, which is the light grey. And you can see that if you have two and a half portions of vegetables, you reduce your heart disease by 16%. But you can almost double that if you eat 10 portions. Stroke, 33% reduction. Cardiovascular disease, 28. Cancer, 13. And premature death, 
15% reduction for two and a half portions and 10 portions, 31%. And that's really where we are at the moment. We know that simple lifestyle changes can have a huge impact on reducing morbidity and mortality. But what about this? This is the world that we're entering into. Huge advances in regenerative medicine. I'm sure you read about them uh, daily. They're now in the popular press. And age retardation. Age retardation is the idea uh, that we actually stop ourselves aging. So how much life expectancy will we be gaining if we have an intensive application of scientific medicine? Now, before we look at longevity, just bear in mind, of course, the inequalities we have so we are going to be talking about actually life extension rather than life expectancy, because I think it's highly unlikely that within the next 20 to 30 years, everybody in the world is going to benefit from these advances. But some people might. So the whole area of biotechnology. 3D printing, you can now print a human heart. Uh, nanotechnology, all the genetics of altering our genetics. Stem cell research. Uh, and just to give you an example of that last one, we um, have a fantastic stem cell institute at Oxford. It's one of 300 across the world that works with a particular kind of stem cell research. And we decided it would be really interesting to look at their data and say, gosh, if this technology could be widely available, what kind of life expectancies would we be looking at in the UK population? And it's a special kind of stem cell research because it is adult stem cell research. Uh, there's a real problem with embryonic stem cell research. A lot of people have real ethical concerns with it. Uh, and also, there's a huge risk of rejection. But now, they really can. They can take a piece of skin, they can turn it into a therapeutic uh, um, stem cell, and they can put it back into the body. And we know that they've had success. They've grown the muscles in the eye, they've grown muscles in the heart, and they've grown muscles in the leg. And in theory, this technology is ready to go out it's at that stage. But talking to my colleague, he said, oh, there's a problem here. Because, of course, what we're doing is we're growing cells. We're encouraging cells to rejuvenate and to grow. That's good when you're a baby, but as we all know, as an adult, that's what cancer is. Cancer is cells that are out of control and multiplying. And he said, we know that some people, if given this um, uh, technique, this um, intervention, they will develop cancer but we don't know how many. We need a population study whereby we can say... <laughs> I'm a demographer, OK? <laughs> we need a population study where we can really look to say, is it 10%, is it 20%, is it 50%? And then we have to make a really big decision. Is it that we just accept that we take these technologies and we all live with cancer? And that obviously costs money, because if we're going to live with cancer, then we're going to need more pharma and drugs and therapies. Or do we say, actually, why are we pushing and pushing to living longer and longer and longer, particularly in a world that is actually becoming overpopulated? And we know we're currently 7 billion, we're going to go to 10 billion, and a huge uh, percentage of that is going to be because we're living longer. It isn't just the more births, it's just that because we're living longer, we're having these multiple generations together. So should we be pushing uh, in this way? But, going back to what I was saying, this is the picture that we're going to face in the UK and in many, many other high-income countries. This is the projected increase in deaths for England and Wales. This is going to happen. What we've done here is we have projected the number of deaths, and you can see deaths occur basically in your 80s uh, in the UK. Uh, we have the um, unshaded, that's um, men are blue and women are, are yellow, unshaded. Um, sorry, the shaded is what is happening now. The unshaded is what is going to happen in 2040. And think back to what I said about the number of centenarians. We have a massive birth cohort coming back up. They're all benefiting from increases in life expectancy, and they're all going to be dying together. So this is the picture of death uh, that many high-income countries are going to be facing. And that's not with technology. That is about to happen. Um, this is just really um, for your interest, because I think you get to see these slides. These are just some of the things that the UK at the moment is doing around ageing, life expectancy and longevity. Uh, but hopefully that has just given you a very, very quick rush through some of the demographic and biological science behind that sort of more focused world uh, that you work in. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor. I think it would be remiss of us to not let any questions be asked. So um, anyone who might have a question, if you could raise your hand and we'll try to get a mic to you. I don't think I'm quite the oldest uh, participant in this audience, but I'm getting near there. So um, the very interesting subject matter for those of us who are nearing death. Uh, <laughs> And those of us who had some scares, I've had a triple bypass uh, about four years ago, so, you know, it's, it's real to me. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is, whenever I read stuff about um, longevity issues, not longevity, life expectancy mm -hmm. issues, in Europe in particular, it's about getting people to work longer. Yes. And you haven't mentioned a single bit of that, and healthy living to me is not only just being able to do those fantastic stuff on the parallel bars, mm -hmm. but to be able to work and to, yes. and to feel uh, contributing to society. Do, do you, does your institution do any yeah. work on that? So my own research area is on the family and work, and I have a, another sort of lecture, and if you ever invite me back again, I can give it, which is all around family and work and whatever. Um, and this, this thing, so the future of aging population was that UK thing that I chaired, and we looked very much at work, the industrial strategy in the UK, we have four challenges. One of them is the aging population, and that is also looking at work. And I think that's a really, really important point. So we have done a lot of survey work at Oxford. We have a very, very big global aging survey. South Africa is in it. Uh, 44,000 respondents from 24 countries. And we um, looked at all aspects um, of people between 40 and 80, what their attitudes and behaviors were. And the one thing that consistently came over were things about contribution, contribution and status. Um, and definitely uh, in Europe, and actually, actually here, um, among your sort of higher income population, and in the US, we found ourselves, you all, we all found ourselves in a situation where we were withdrawing earlier and earlier from the labor market at a time when our healthy life expectancy was increasing. And we know that if we've made any kind of impact, it is, for most people, it is health from 55 to 75. We've really increased that and the ability uh, of people to work. And many, many people want to work longer. Um, and so governments inevitably are pushing back retirement ages. And I think they're doing it for two reasons. One, people want to work longer. Secondly, people realize they can't possibly retire at 55 and live to 105 and survive on whatever pension they have. But also, within an aging population, and remember, European populations are aging. Aging isn't just about living longer, it's also a, a reduction in the number of children you have. And particularly if a country like the UK, which has remained young, actually, so the UK and France are very young demographically, because we've always welcomed migrants. And if because of a particular bleep in our political system at the moment, we're going to reject migrants, and I hope we don't, then we are really going to have to look at our older population and say, you've just got to work longer. Because basically, people in their 50s and 60s, you're going to be the ones who are going to have to be caring for the older population because we don't have the migrants coming in and doing that. And you're going to have to stay in the workplace longer. And we did some modelling, in fact, for the Guardian newspaper, where we said that if because of Brexit we stopped all migrants uh, coming into the country, now, I hope, I'm sure that won't happen, but if we did, every person in Britain would have to work for another 18 months just to compensate for the reduction of workers within our population. Um, so, there's a huge amount of research that is happening across the world, um, which is looking at redesigning work, redesigning workplaces, looking at ergonomics, human resources, to enable a population between 50 and 70 to keep fit and active and relevant to the knowledge economies within which we all work. And the really, really good news, and I will probably stop at the end of this because I think I'm running over, um, is uh, we have two types of intelligence. We have fluid intelligence and we have crystalline intelligence. And fluid intelligence we uh, have when we're younger and from about 20 onwards we start to lose it. And that's that very, very, very quick. We can take in lots of information, we can make lots of decisions, uh, and it, it's that kind of quick intelligence. And so it's, the idea is if, if you play snap with a young child, they'll often beat you because they're very, very quick. And even by the time you're in your mid-twenties, you're losing that. There's a second type of intelligence called crystalline intelligence. And that is the more lateral thinking, creative intelligence. And we don't peak till we're in our 40s or even 50s with that. And it doesn't start declining till we're in our 70s. And again, I've got a really nice lecture on that. <laughs> a 
I love coming to South Africa. <laughs> I'm giving you lots and lots of hooks. <laughs> um, and, and a way to think about that is um, if, if you take a sentence, you take out a word, and you say to a 15-year-old, here are 20 words, choose the right one to go in, they'll struggle. But if you say that to a 40-year-old, they'll instantly get the right word because they understand the subtleties of language. Now, just think about the other big, no, we have challenges of environment, we have challenges of population, and we also have challenges of technology. And what kind of jobs is technology taking away? It's the fast, quick thinking data jobs that young people are good at. Robotics and AI are nowhere near taking away the creative, crystalline, intelligent jobs that older adults are good at. So there's a huge, I was in Canberra last month um, talking to the Australian Treasury at one of their meetings, and they're doing serious research on people aged 50 to 70 because they're realizing that within a knowledge economy, we actually need people who are thinking in that kind of creative way. And it takes time, and I've seen wonderful brain scans whereby they give a young person a question and one side of the brain lights up, quick, quick, quick thinking. They give it to a middle-aged person and both sides light up because they're already using their creative side to answer it. So your, a very short answer to your very interesting question is, I think we will be working longer, but I think particularly for those who have got a higher income, and that's why we need to reduce inequalities, um, people will want to live, work longer, but we may well be working in a part-time or a more complex way. But no, I mean, the idea that we retire at 55 and live to 105, I think that's already gone in many countries. Sorry, okay. <laughs>